Welcome to the Dental Marketing Podcast, a podcast that helps dentists win in the online world of modern day marketing. Each week, we cover the most cutting edge marketing tactics and strategies that are working right now across our client base to drive leads, phone calls, and more new patients for dentists. Now, here's your host and founder of Kickstart Dental Marketing, Chris Pistorius. Hi, everybody. This is Chris Pistorius here again with the Dental Marketing Podcast. Uh, today, we've got a super special guest. Um, I'm a little starstruck because I've been listening to and reading his stuff for years. I'm so glad to have him on the show today. This is Dr. Howard Ferran. He is the creator. I mean, he does a lot of stuff, and we'll get into that in a second, but he's actually the creator, founder, owner of Dental Town, which I know a lot of you use as a major resource to help run your dental practices. So, Howard, thanks so much for taking the time to be on today. Hey, it's an honor. Uh, we should start a mutual admiration club because I've been a big fan of yours for a decade, too. Awesome. Well, thank you. Well, I'm going to get right to it. Um, as you know, you've you've got tons of experience. You've got you've forgotten more things about dentistry than I'll ever know. So what I'm after here and, and to pick your brain is, you know, how to help my clients, how to help potential clients, how to help dentistry in general, which I know that you're a big part of as well. But why don't you tell me a little bit about how you created Dental Town first and, and how that idea started and and just a little background there. Oh man, you got to go back to, I got, um, I got out of school in 87 and then it was about 1994. I saw Amazon go public and I couldn't figure out what all the hoopla was, but I, I kept an eye on it. Didn't buy a share of it. And I just kept watching, watching, watching through 94, 95, 96, 97. And then about 98, I finally realized, oh my God, this really is going to be huge. And then I was on, I never had an original idea. My next door neighbor was a dentist. So I went to work with Kenny Anderson and my dad and my dad owned a Sonic drive-in making cheeseburgers and Kenny was a dentist. And I thought the x-ray machine was a hell of a lot cooler than a, than a grill. And, um, but um, I was on the ESPN website and they started this message board thing and we were talking about football and I'm like, gosh, darn, I wish I could be doing this with dentists and talking about root canals and fillings and marketing. And so I hired uh, Ken Scott and then we started Dental Town and we were the first, we beat for Facebook by five years. And uh, that first mover advantage, you know, the greatest university is Harvard only because it's first. Coke was uh, launched 11 years before Pepsi. They're still number one. And that first mover advantage, advantage is kind of like a hall of fame website. And we also have OrthoTown, too. The orthodontists were the only specialists who wanted their own site. All the other specialists and all the orthodontists are on Dental Town, but they just want a private community of just orthodontists. But um, it's really it's really been cool to watch social media. You know, we, we had our first generation, you know, the first 20 years, and the first is always the worst, and, and everybody's learning how uh, that's going on and everything. But it did change the world. I mean, Facebook, um, and uh, which owns Instagram, and then Alphabet, which owns Google and YouTube, um, they sucked out about 80% of all the advertising dollars in America, and that killed um, billboards, it killed radio, it's killing TV, and, um, and that's why these dentists got to get sophisticated because um, they're competing now against DSOs. And DSOs have enough scale where they can sit there and say, well, let's just get the one billboard on the corner of uh, the two highways and radio. I mean, for for a hundred dollars, you can get an hour commercial. Um, Clear Choice, that whole that implant company has been sold five times, and now um, um, Bob Fontana of Aspen owns it because. My gosh, they can do 30 minute infomercials on um, implants in a day. So now you got this individual dentist and um, you know, the, the first guys I noticed that were really, really smart about advertising was the orthodontist for a couple of exact reasons. Number one, they knew each of their new patients was worth basically 6,500 bucks and they knew where their overhead was. So, I mean, if they went on Shark Tank, and if you go on Shark Tank, obviously the smartest man on Shark Tank is the bold guy. It's always the bold guy. Do you notice that? 
And I have. <laughs> and, and, you, and you pitch your business, your demo office to Mr. Wonderful. First thing he says is, well, what's your cost of new customer right. acquisition? No dentist knows, but orthodontist, that's an easy figure. Because um, there's the, what, what is the average customer value? Dentists are like, God, I don't know. Orthodontists are like, it is actually 6,500. So in my better. journey, when I got out of school in 87, you got to remember um, the yellow pages just became legal after a Supreme Court decision where two lawyers in Phoenix said, well, that violates my free speech not to advertise. So, then, so it, it, it happened in Arizona first, but even by the time I got out, it was a very underused taboo thing. And the first guys to jump out on it were the orthodontist. And they were the, it was an orthodontist who was the first guy I ever met that three percent of collections went straight to advertising. Now I could name you a hundred orthodontists where that is eight to ten percent because they say, "Well, I get sixty five hundred dollars from Invisalign, and here's my marketing costs, and here's my overhead. It's like shooting fish in a barrel." But general, and so but orthodontists they, they get their money back in two years. Um, general dentists that takes about five years and since they have a whole distribution of uh, just a cleaning just a filling all the way to a big old case um, they, they've always not understood their marketing but what's going to really bring it to their attention is when they're no longer competing against a single dentist across the street but now they got some DSO that's got a thousand locations and they're extremely sophisticated so um, dentists, uh, if, if they want to play in the in the in the big leagues with the professional players, um, they're probably going to have to outsource their marketing to someone like you. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's you know, I I think you hit the nail on the head, several nails on the head actually. In that, you know, we talk with clients a lot about that, about you know, they're they're struggling with competition. And it's not just local competition, it's a lot of pressure from DSOs. And a lot of our strategies are around how to compete with that. And, and how there are ways to compete with that without breaking the bank also. So you just have to get a little creative, kind of grassroots about it. And, and you can still compete and, and relieve some of that comp competition for sure. Let me, let me ask you this, what, what do you see as right now, um, other than the competitive struggles with DSLs, but what else is, is really kind of threatening local dentistry right now, would you say? Well, um, I think, um, you know, all dentists would say there it's a very competitive environment. I would say that um, the reason the 20 richest countries all want socialized medicine is um, by the government is because the same government is the one that blocks out all their competition. I mean, if you're a dentist in India, you can't move to Phoenix, Arizona and start doing dentistry. I'm on the Mexican border. And every time a Mexican dentist comes up here and goes to Guadalupe, which is 100% Mexican and native Indians and starts practicing dentistry on the poor, the government arrests them, puts them in jail or deports them or whatever. So, um, so it, it's hard to say that healthcare is competitive because um, when I was a little kid, you know, they couldn't import cars from Germany and Japan. Right. And when they, they released, and, and the car, General Motors had half market share. They were very expensive and the cars never worked. When I was a little kid, if I walked down the sidewalk on a Saturday, every third or fourth garage was a dad, his son, and two uncles trying to fix this piece of crap Chevy and get it running. <laughs> so I, it, it's, it's crazy to say that healthcare is competitive because they block all foreign competition uh, from entering with their immigration policy. Um, but, um, but, but within the realm of the United States, competing against DSOs, um, competing against insurance, I'd say what threatens them the most right now is the onslaught of inflation. And I'm, I turned 59 this month. Um, I hear no one talking about it unless they're my age. I graduated from high school in 80. And in 81, interest, rate, in, in interest rates were 20 and a half percent. Unemployment and inflation was double digit. And so inflation is just completely back. I mean, um, the, when this pandemic hit, 
the stock market dropped about $850 million, not even a, uh, I mean, $850 million, not even a trillion, $850 billion, not quite a trillion. And the Trump-Biden response was $5 trillion. So you're looking at an economy, a global economy, where three out of every four dollars in circulation today were printed in the last year. And people compare this to the the, um, the percent of debt to GDP we had in World War II. But you got to remember those bonds were paid by real money from Americans taking their money out from underneath their bed and buying a war bond, which you pay them a nickel a year. So the deal is, if um, you know, I went to Creighton in 1980. Warren Buffett is from Omaha, so is his partner Charlie Munger and Warren came over and spoke to our business class. And I remember Business 101, someone jokingly said, Creighton was known for their medical school, dental school, and law school. Someone jokingly asked him, like, which one would you go to? And he, and he told me the answer I didn't listen. He said, well, I would never go into healthcare because it's very capital intensive and someone else sets your fee. He goes, I, w- I want to go into a business with low capital intensive. Right? Like if Geico Insurance doubled their business, they just need to double the number of, of cubicles with people dialing for dollars and typing on a keyboard. But you double a hospital. I mean, you got all this uh, all this stuff. Yeah. I mean, I've seen dental officers routinely that by the time you do the land and the building and the Taj Mahal, they're, they're looking at one and a half to $3 million. So, um, so I would say if you're locked into an uh, insurance company and they say you get $1 per filling, and your costs are going up 5, 10, 15, 20%. Is the insurance company going to rapidly adjust their fees to keep you up with inflation? Or are you just going to start making less and less money? So I think the inflation on a fixed third party fee is terrible. And that's why Invisalign, if you look at dentistry uh, for, for decades, uh, dentistry um, uh, selling stuff to dentists, about 40% of the market is US and Canada, 40% is Europe, and 20% is the rest of the world. And when you look at their numbers, um, it, it's been, I mean, it's a 200 year old profession that started with GB Black in Paris, France. So it just really just grows with and contracts with inflation. The only thing that's growing double digit is orthodontics, clear liners, and implants. And the reason they're so lucrative is because a third party is not setting your fee. They tried to set fees, but like, remember when the insurance companies um, said that you couldn't charge them more than X dollars for bleaching and it went all the way to Supreme Court in Tennessee, I think it was like, you know, you don't even cover bleaching. How could you set our fee? Uh, so, so the dentists haven't been fighting uh, for equality uh, in, in the eyes of the consumer. I, I expect that will go to a different legal dimension, you know, but that's up to the ADA and government and things like that. Um, but I would say that um, going in, I mean, when a dentist gets out of school and says, well, I don't know what I want to do, well, you got to pick one. You either get a lot of blood and guts and, um, and get into implants, or you're going to get into the soft and pretty Invisalign. And I can usually tell by looking at their x-ray, because if you're like me, when you do a root canal, if you want to get all the way to the bottom and a puff of sealer out the apex, you're an apical barbarian and you just love blood. And all of your assistants, you know, when they see like a big pus thing pop, all, all those assistants go, ooh, like, yeah. <laughs> and if that stuff just grosses you out, you go into bleaching, bonding, veneers, clear liners, whatever. But um, I'm telling you that the number one goal of the species is to survive long enough to reproduce that offspring. And the way the animal kingdom is, unlike the uh, unicell, unlike, you know, um, fungi and algae, and, and we just don't divide into two, Oh, we, we, we split our DNA into two uh, pairs and we got to go mix gametes with someone. And going out there, um, I think this pandemic has been a huge boom for dentistry. It's already proven um, because if you're a man like me, I mean, think about it. I brush my teeth and floss in the shower. I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't stand around looking mirrors all day. I do, I, too. I do the same thing. I thought I was the only one that did that. I uh, am my, my my five. I grew up with five sisters, man. They'd spend an hour in the bathroom before they go to grammar school. So so now there's all these men on Zoom, and they're all looking at their face, and they're looking at their teeth, and they're looking like, oh my god. And male makeup, which isn't really even a thing, it's already up like four hundred percent since the pandemic started. And when I went into Walgreens. Um, I went to the um, the makeup counter booth area and talked to that lady. I said, when I read that, I said, it's true. She goes, 
she goes, just all kind of people you would never expect. I want to cover up this thing or this, that. And they're asking me, so, so now that you, now that the pandemic's got everyone looking in the mirror that used to never look in the mirror, like a bunch of old, ugly men, um, they're, they're, they're right for Invisalign. I mean, I, I think the ultimate close is they say, how, how do you like your uh, Zoom conference look? I mean, are you, are you liking right. what you see in the mirror? And, 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 I, and I used to call old Dennis, I remember <laughs> when I went to school, the big cosmetic guru was Jim Pride. And he was sitting there in the lecture. And another one was Walter Haley. I made this remark twice and got the same response from them. They're, you know, he's up there pontificating at the Arizona Dental Association. That, How could you not sell cosmetic dentistry? I mean, they all want to do it. They all want to do it. I raised my hand. And I said, well, why don't you do it? You've got some of the darkest, brownest, gnarliest, ugliest teeth I've ever seen. And you're a dentist speaking to dentists. He lost it. I mean, he almost couldn't continue. And everybody I was with was just laughing their ass off. See, and then Walter Haley, when I talked about to Walter Haley, I was with actually great cosmetic. I was with David Hornbrook and, and uh, Bill Dickerson, the two cosmetic legends who'd started LBI. And they told him, you know, it's true, Walter, and we'll do it for free. You get like this $50,000 veneer case, look like a moon's so free. And he's like, ah, I don't care. I mean, he's some good old boy from Texas, couldn't even give a crap. And his business was lecturing to sell cosmetic dentistry to dentists. And he couldn't, wouldn't even do it. So I think this Zoom is going to make people see the truth that, uh, wow, I, I remember I, I lost the, I, I was able to keep in shape the best when I used to do Bikram yoga. Because you go into a room in a bathing suit, they have mirrors all over the wall, and that's the only time you ever get to stare at yourself in a bathing suit. And I'd look at that mirror and think, God dang, you're fat. You don't need, you need to stop eating crap. And that whole 90 minute yoga deal was this really, you know, reminder that, uh, dude, you don't know what you look like naked. And um, so I, I, I think this is going to be a big, it, will, it is already a big boom for cosmetic dentistry. And by the way, implants, the same thing. Every study I've seen on implants, um, you know, dentists always say, oh, I'll give you, I'll give you a, a true story of my first major implant case. Her name was Catherine. It was back in like 87, 88, 89. And um, she told me, um, I, I never had asked her about implants or anything. And, and she told me she wanted them. And I thought, um, I said, well, Catherine, you always told me that you had no problems eating, chewing, that you could even eat an apple and all this stuff. I said, so what changed your mind? She goes, well, you know what? She goes, at my age, my girlfriend just keep dying. And they keep dying in, in, while they're asleep. And I can't wear my dentures when I'm sleeping. And I'm afraid of dying in my sleep and having them find me without my teeth. And I thought, yeah, dang, man. So, so even wow. today, when you look at implant cases, if, if you really get to the crux of it and you really ask them, they're not doing it because they can't eat a cheeseburger. They're doing it because there's a missing space there and they've got a tract of gamma, uh, mate and mixed gametes and it's a very complicated mating ritual. It makes a, like, like a peacock or, you know, they're, all the animal kingdom mating rituals are insanely complex. And having um, your teeth not be a negative and just be neutral is a good thing. If you can make them whiter, brighter, and sexier and make the peacock feathers all come out, uh, it works better. So, yeah. um, wow. Well, that's, I tell you what, you've got, that's, that's, you could unpack a whole webinar just in what you just said. That's awesome information. <laughs> and it's going to help a lot of people watching this. But I, I did have a question. If you had to do it all over again, the dentistry side of this, what would you change? What would you do differently? Yeah, that's a great question. What would I do differently? I mean, I definitely would have done it because you got you got to go back. You know, a lot of people they they look at you know all of our heroes are failed men. I mean, it's like it's like they think they're a genius and they found out that some great man had a great flaw. You know, they never said he walked on water. Um, but 
Um, you got to go back to, I was born in 62. There wasn't any of this technology. There wasn't computers and this and that. And man, when I would go to, when, when I first saw my neighbor, Kenny Anson, take an x-ray through the tooth, and then you got to go in a dark room with like the hottest dental assistant in the world and to go up <laughs> this x-ray. And then I go learn my dad make a cheeseburger and onion rings. The, the technology blew me away. And the other thing that it blew me away, it, it was just like physics and the fact that um, we we'll look at Stephen Hawking. He lived his whole life, and he and he died before they even know what a black hole is and what's on the other side. Is it a white hole? I mean, you know. And I realized that dentistry was bigger than any dentist that ever lived, and that you could be a dentist and study your whole life and still go to the grave uh, with unknown unknowns that you would never even have known. And it was, um, and it's part of the human body. Health is wealth. I mean, if you lose your life, you have nothing. And, um, you know, the, the health, the wealth, I mean, I, I, it was so easy for me to find a real purpose and passion uh, when you're trying to learn, discover, and help someone else stay alive um, on, on an earth where 98.5% of all the species before us are extinct and, um, and they're going extinct every year. And the chance that we will go extinct is absolutely positive. I mean, we're not going to go through the black hole. I mean, when this whole Milky Way goes through the black hole, I, I doubt my teeth are going to make it. Um, but <laughs> It, it, it just, I, I just had a lot of purpose, a lot of passion, and I know I got accepted to med school too, and at Creighton, and I didn't want to do that just because dentists forget of all the politics that goes on in hospitals, and and now it's something like um, seven out of every ten physicians is an employee for a hospital, which is about fifty percent, or a big um, corporate DSO for about another twenty percent. Only thirty percent of physicians own your own building. And the thing I liked about what Kenny Anderson did is, um, you know, he owned his own land and building. Um, he was a dictator. I mean, if, if he didn't want you to work there, you didn't go. If he didn't want to treat you as a patient, you can't, you know, just a simple life in a small kingdom where you're the king and you've got, you know, a half dozen helpers and you have your own people coming in and um, gosh, they, uh, you know, I, I, I love it. And I, I can't really think anything I would have done different. Yeah, well, that's awesome. That's that's great. You know, one, one struggle that we see um, with some of our clients is especially the ones that are, you know, they've been an associate for a little while, maybe, and now they want to start their own, right? And the question we get sometimes is, based on your experience, is it better to buy an existing practice with a, you know, a base of patients? Or do you do you start off scratch? What do you think? Well, uh, you know, that's another great question you have. I can tell you've been in this a long time, but I just want to tell you about um, when, when, the D, when these um, DSOs popped up, you know, the, the first round was way back in the days in the 80s when uh, Orthodontic Centers of America went public and there was like a dozen on NASDAQ. And what was their business model? Their business model was if you go sell a house in Phoenix, if it's three bedroom, two bath, you're, you're going to offer today. If it's four bedroom, three car garage, it's totally liquid. But if you're an NFL player and you custom built a 19 bedroom house with a seven car garage, I mean, most of your professional players, their number one mistake was the house they bought because it's a liquid, they can't sell it. In Orthodontic Senators of America, that founder, um, Gaspar Lazarus, knew that if your orthodontic practice did a million dollars a year, you could sell it in an hour. But if you built up to three or four million, it was illiquid. So he was buying all the illiquid ones, and that's what Hartland was doing. So when I look back at every single general dentist that had a dental office doing three to five million dollars a year, they all had the same strategy. And that was this, which answers your question. They they graduated from school, they went to a small town that had 10 dentists. And every five years, the oldest guy would retire and in most towns. The old guy would just sell it to some new young guy with a lot of energy and the competition say vicious. And these guys would say, well, I'm going to buy out the old man's practice and I'm going to have him roll all of his practice of mine. And then I'm going to tell him, well, you say you're going to retire, but if you want to stay a day or two a week, I mean, and they always do. Yeah. And, and so what they did is when they graduated school, they were the 10th dentist in their town. Five years later, there's only nine and then eight and then seven. And, and now they're 65 and there's only four dental offices in the town. 
but one office has five dentists and they're doing five million dollars a year. And you know what? That was the exact same strategy that Thomas Watson Jr. did of IBM. And and the reason he became big is he inherited the company from his dad. He drank his way through college and swears he didn't learn a damn thing. And uh, you know, doesn't even know why he got the degree. But he only noticed one thing. They grew up in this small town and there were three hardware stores in this little small town. And he'd go to one line to be long and he'd go to another one line to be long. So he'd go to this other one and they had two cash, they had two employees and he got there faster. And one day he realized there's three locations, but there's just four salesmen. And each salesman has a quarter of the market. So it's not based on locations. It's based on salesmen and nobody knows what they're supposed to buy to fix this, what not to bolt they're going to know. And he goes, no one knows software. So when he took over IBM, he told his head scientist, look, I'm going to stay out of your way. I don't know what you're doing. I don't even care. Just go do your thing. I'm going to focus on sales. And he started the IBM sales deal. And every six weeks, he got, you know, 20 new salesmen and they got him a three-piece suit and a briefcase and went through the whole sales pitch. And he always said, if 70% of all the computer salesmen in the world work for IBM, we will have 70% of the market. And it came true. And they asked him, they said, well, why didn't you go for 80, 90 or 100? He goes, well, then I knew the government would have to step in and they would break me up. So I just thought that was about the most I can get away with. And, and it's, it's just absolutely true. So, you know, um, we already know this about um, a practice. I mean, why would you go in and start a new supply when you can buy out an existing supply? Right. You know, building more than, in fact, let me tell you this. There's 168 hours in a week, and the average dental office opened 32 hours a week, which is 19% of the week. So if you have like an Uber dental app where a patient said, I want to make an appointment, and all these other dentists um, had um, Uber dental offices they can rent, I mean, 80% of all the dental operatory capacity is never being used. So, I mean, it's just insane to go buy, build another dental office when, when every dental office in America is not being used four out of every five hours a day. Right. As far as competition with the DSOs, all the, all, every major DSO guy is already on the record saying, I'm not going to the rural because they tried that. And by the time the kids get out of dental, dental school, they're at the prime time to attract a mate to mix gamites. And they have better odds in a city of Phoenix than they do two hours out in the middle of nowhere in Eloy, Arizona. So, so about by the time they were, um, you know, well put in the rural, on any given day, 10% of their offices didn't even have a dock in the box. So you know there's no DSOs in the rural. And um, so uh, that's a haven. So I would say go to the rural. And by the time you're two hours away from where a Southwest Airlines plane takes off, they, they drop insurance. I mean, I mean you're, you know, you're one of only three guys in a town of 3,000. And, um, you know, um, they, they just don't even take it. So and you can always sell because your food's like, well, how much is a root canal thousand? How much crown thousand? How much partial thousand? How much denture thousand? Everything's rounded off to a thousand. <laughs> and they all have about 40% overhead because in a small town, labor, you know, a 15 hour dollar job at Walmart's considered bank. And right. you, know, you have to pay a hygienist $50 an hour in, um, in San Francisco. So I would say get two hours away from the airport, go rural, buy out an old guy instead of building more capacity. And if you're a hell of a programmer, you ought to make an Uber dental app uh, so that patients can meet these young dentists out of school and any office they want you. I mean, they could be working for a DSO. We won't let them do that, but on their day off, they could be meeting a dentist at, at like my dental office when it's closed. I mean, it's closed every day at 7 p.m. It's closed Saturday and Sunday. I mean, uh, yeah. so I know that was a long-winded answer to a very short oh, question. That was awesome. That was great. Are you looking to grow your practice but are a little unclear on what the best way is? Let us help you out. We have over 13 years of experience in helping practices just like yours increase new patient growth. Just go to kickstartdental.com and sign up for a free strategy session where we will give you some great insights on how to take your practice to the next level. Um, we're going to wrap up here in a minute, but to any of those 
out, that are out there, I can't imagine there's many that don't know about Dental Town. Why don't you tell us a little bit about why, what people get out of Dental Town, how it works, and and why somebody somebody should pay attention to Dental Town? Um, I would first of all, all your scientific institutions like NASA, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Every, you know, I've been to many of them. That they only use the message board format. The social media that people are used to is called LIFO, last in, first out, and it's kind of just <laughs> just almost entertainment. <clears throat> But on a message board format, all 6 million posts made on Dental Town are still there. They're archived, they're searchable. Um, when we look at all the studies on like Facebook and Twitter, it's scientifically factual that everybody balkanizes. So if I'm pro dental insurance and you get on there and say, don't take it, we'll just unfriend you. So everybody's in this hardened position. But when you go to Dental Town, you can't unfriend someone. You can't delete someone. So a lot of people are there in a bubble and they believe something like, say, that, um, you know, implants uh, cause gum disease. You got to do ceramic and, and on their Facebook page or a guru. No, in dental town, people just start popping holes in their, in their bubble and they, they either are a scientist and want these observations to grow with or they're emotional and they run from it. So um, I, I just think it's a um, it's a treasure. And the other thing is on Facebook, I know who you are. But but on downtown, I know who you are when you register. But if you want to call yourself Smiley yeah. Tooth, there has to be a place for a stupid question and like a specialist. An endodontist can't get on Facebook and say, "Here's a case of mine that failed." Does anybody know what went wrong? Right. I mean, all of his competitors would be sending that to everybody, but he could on Dental Town. Yeah. So I, I want a place where, um, no, you're not going to grow and put yourself in some bubble. And, you know, I mean, you're still a doctor and you have to be aware of that. There's people that think other thoughts. And uh, so I, I, I think it's a beautiful. Thing. And as far as the business um, on Dental Town, I have my 30 day dental MBA. It's free on Dental Town. It's also on YouTube. It's also on iTunes. And um, my gosh, I uh, when I went to uh, MBA school, I took my laptop, took notes just towards my dental practice. And then when I came out, I ran it out the notes. It was 30 hours long. I called Dr. Franz 30 day dental MBA. It still gets a thousand downloads a month just on iTunes. Wow. Uh, the views on YouTube are insane, but um, that's what's neat about the internet and, and downtown. All the information you need to do a root canal or run a business is zero cost. It just, yeah. you just need your time. And, uh, you know, when I was a little kid, um, all of that information was hidden in expensive universities and only rich kids went to, and you couldn't could do that in a poor town or a poor country. And now it's all there on the internet at zero cost. So if you really want uh, to work like no dentist has for a decade, you can still live like no dentist has for three decades. So if you just want to get out there and work your butt off and hustle and uh, do what is uh, everybody knows what to do, it's all spelled out of my 30-day dental MBA. It's all on downtown. The, 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 the opportunity is sitting right there, but it's not going to be delivered to you. It's not going to be easy. You're going to have to do it the old-fashioned way, which is get out of dental school and work your ass off yeah. for a decade. But here's my last piece of advice regarding you and me. Number one, this isn't a paid um, uh, endorsement. He didn't give me any money. Uh, but if he ever does come out and visit his grandma in, uh, in Phoenix, you got to buy me one beer. That's all. That's yeah, all his eyes is asking. But, um, but, but the, the deal is, dude, stay humble. Stay in your wheelhouse. You're always, you think you're an expert in everything and you're not. And um, my gosh, you, you don't know. Uh, um, you think you know everything about marketing, but you, you probably don't. And I'm telling you that the DSOs, I've met their marketing agents and it's a department. It's five, six, seven, eight people and they are not kidding around. So then for you to sit there as a dentist say, oh yeah, I mean, anybody can be an excellent marketer and understand Google and Facebook and all. No, no, no. You need someone that specializes all they do. You know what orthodontists can do in Invisalign better than you. And you know that there's a marketing guy that can do marketing better than you. So stay humble, stay in your house. I'm still always meeting dentists that run into a disaster with little things like your lease. There's a dentist in Phoenix and on his lease, 
Uh, it was a triple net lease, and three doors down, um, it flooded the whole the whole roof. It, it was long story short. He was the only tenant in a 10,000 square foot building who had the money to pay for it. The yoga studio, everybody else just walked out on the lease and said, uh, you know, call me, call it a bankruptcy. So, you know, you need a lawyer before you sign a real estate lease. Yeah. Um, you might need a guy who spent a decade in dental marketing uh, before you start your ad campaign. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I think that's great advice. <laughs> yeah, same hey, Howard, stay humble in your house. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I really appreciate this. And if you don't mind, I know you're a busy guy, but maybe in a few months we can hook back up and, and tackle a couple more subjects. If, if that's Anytime cool. you want, man. It'd be a blast. I, I, I can talk about those until the cows come home. I, I just awesome. love it. That's great, man. Well, Howard, thanks again. And thanks to everybody out there watching today. I know you got some great information out of this. And be sure to join us next week for another great episode of the Dental Marketing Podcast. Thanks for joining us this week on the Dental Marketing Podcast. Make sure to visit our website, www.kickstartdental.com slash podcast, where you can subscribe to the show in iTunes, Spotify, or via RSS, so you'll never miss a show. While you're at it, if you found value in the show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. If you are ready to grow your practice, then you might want to schedule a free strategy session with us. Just go to kickstartdental.com and click the free strategy session button and give us 15 minutes of your time to change your practice forever. Be sure to tune in next week for our next episode. And thanks for listening to the Dental Marketing Podcast by Kickstart Dental Marketing, where dentists go to win online.